I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, Teacher Andrew is back with another question. And I gotta say, I am so enjoying the fact that he is making these videos and sending them in, and I'm able to clip them into the show because it is so interesting to be able to see the audience and engage with you guys and have you be part of the show. And, you know, in some ways, uh, it certainly makes things easier for me because I have a direct question to respond to and you guys can hear it but it does actually make more work because I'm gonna put the video into the show and that's actually harder to do uh, than just, just reading off a question or whatever, but totally worth it because it's so cool that we're doing this. So thank you again to teacher Andrew uh, who sent this in and I encourage all of you to take a moment and think about a, a real question you may have that you wanna take a video or some message you wanna add into the show that you could send in. This stuff is really, really cool. I'm, I'm very much enjoying this. So thank you so much. We're gonna get to that right after the bump. On today's show, we're going to be talking about Andrew's question having to do with luggage and luggage requirements for flying on Spirit Airlines. If you're not used to uh, Nicaragua and how to get in and out of the country, if you're flying into Managua, and especially if you're coming from the United States, your main airlines for coming here is Spirit. There are others, of course, Aeromexico, United, American, uh, Copa, Avianca but Spirit is the main one coming from the United States. It is the lowest cost and it is the most common that we see people using. Of course, all of them have their place and we would love to see more airlines come in as well, but Spirit seems to be expanding. And my experiences using all these different airlines, uh, I believe at this point, I have literally flown all of them here. Uh, Spirit is far and away my first choice. I would use Copa second and Aeromexico third, if at all possible, and I've heard some good, I've had some rough experiences myself, but Valentina from the show uh, has done a bunch of flying this week with Avianca and her experiences were relatively good uh, with how Avianca treated her and her dogs as they moved to South America. Uh, literally, she's not arrived yet as I'm recording this episode. So uh, those, those would be what I'd recommend. But if you're gonna be here, because it flies directly from Fort Lauderdale to uh, Managua and at incredibly low prices, often or at least occasionally, well below $100 per direction. So well under 200, like in the 170s, 180s round trip, it's hard not to put Spirit on your radar. And then we're also gonna talk a little bit about the Spirit credit cards, which Andrew's gonna mention, but I have mentioned previously that I have the Spirit upgraded credit card uh, in order to get even better benefits when flying with them, which makes it so effective to fly between Nicaragua and the United States at the drop of a hat. Now, before anyone mentions it, yes, the big negative with Spirit is that they fly in the middle of the night. This is not purely a negative. It means no traffic. It is much easier to deal with the airport, but a lot of people hate trying to do those things in the middle of the night, and I understand. So it's not for everyone, but it is a solid way to get in and out of the country at very affordable prices. So if you're cost conscious, if you're a budget traveler, or you're doing it really often, then it is probably going to be the airline you want to use because it's going to give you the options that make the most sense in most situations and if you need to if you're here all the time it's very easy to get uh, drivers or to use the best western across the street or the pronto that's there to, to manipulate your time a little bit or make it really easy to stay by the airport and that can make flying in the middle of the night not such a big deal. Of course, you guys gotta be careful. Maybe you're gonna rack up some costs because of those things and discover that the cost savings of Spirit maybe isn't worth it for you. But I think for a lot of you, uh, you're gonna find that it is. Certainly for me, um, that is, I, I choose to fly that way. I find it very uh, comfortable, very affordable, and very reliable, which is a really important thing. Um, so without further ado, Andrew has some questions about his luggage for the flights. Okay, I just thought of another video, Scott, because this is something that I'm thinking about right now, uh, which is relates to the fact that you're so passionate about Spirit Airlines and flying them as much as you can because you like just think that they're a really great airline and you've had a great experience with them. Um, I am planning to um, basically get their premium credit card soon and then basically start to rack up the points to basically put towards a flight at some point. And what I'm, well, the question is, is do you have advice or do you have like Amazon links or anything 
to like actual physical luggage that you've bought that actually gets passed by spirits um pretty strict uh sizing limitations um i've been looking at luggage and i've been finding the smaller bags that are easy to find like the carry-on personal bags or whatever the personal items i think it is and then the check bags are the ones that i can't seem to really find because a lot of medium bags are a little bit too small and a lot of the larger bags are too big so i just wanted to know if you have what what bags if you have any recommendations or suggestions for which bags would actually pass there i know what it is like 62 linear inches for like the length the width and the depth or something like that so i was looking i do doing a lot of research on that i was just wondering if hey it probably would help a lot of people on your channel here who are thinking of moving to nicaragua to f pick out the right luggage if they're going to actually use spirit airlines and that way they avo hopefully avoid you know just any extra oversized baggage fees so anyway Thanks again. That's another question for you. <laughs> See you next time. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for the question. So I talked to my wife, who's the luggage expert. I do nothing with luggage, packing, any of that stuff. My wife handles all of that. And uh, she said that really for spirit, our experience at least, is that they never check the size. That's not a thing. They may have strict guidelines. We've never run into it, and we don't even look at them. Uh, that's probably the wrong thing to do, but it's worked out just fine. We buy big bags. Uh, we normally are just bargain shoppers, right? Luggage gets abused, so we're always looking for deals. Walmart, Kohl's, Costco, those kinds of places. Um, we try to get kind of decent stuff, but we always get what's cheap, right? Because it's we know it's going to get thrown around. We know it's going to get scuffed. We know the wheels are going to get destroyed no matter what we do, and we could spend thousand dollars on luggage maybe it'll last twice as long but we'll spend you know around a hundred and it'll last half as long way better deal and if it gets stolen way better deal right like so we, we we tend to be pretty cheap on that but we've never had any problems the thing that you do have to be quite aware of with spirit is that um, with other airlines you generally generally get a checked baggage weight limit of 50 pounds spirit is 40 pounds. This catches a lot of people, either because they just don't look, or they just assume, or they're flying multiple flights, and they look at one of them, and it's 50, and they're like, ah, it must all be 50, and then they have the wrong weight, and then they get on Spirit, and yes, it's cheaper luggage, but it's because it's only 80% of the, of the items. So definitely be aware of the weight. We, as long as you're within the weight, we have never had them say anything about the size, and generally, that's not what they're concerned about. Weight causes uh, fuel usage. Size doesn't really cause a problem. It's very rare for an airplane to run out of space for check luggage. Of course, you know, carry on, all kinds of problems. Um, personal items, got to be able to fit in the seat in front of you. Um, so that just, you know, backpacks or whatever uh, is important. But for, for the actual luggage, that is the only thing we know. Um, it is worth noting, Spirit has, if you're watching this in real time, uh, which is in the uh, summer of 2024, uh, Spirit has pulled out temporarily during the slow season. Now, if you're flying today, you're okay. But in about a week, they're not going to be flying until it looks like the first week of December. Now, for a lot of people, that's really disrupting them, but they already know. Uh, if you're looking at traveling, you may just have to wait a little bit. Hopefully, that's just a one-time thing. Basically, there's a giant shortage of airline crews in the United States, and so American based airlines are really struggling to have enough pilots and flight crews and one of the ways that they're dealing with this is to reduce the number of places that they fly and Nicaragua already a slow location in the slow season is one of the places that's getting hit and that said uh, a whole bunch of flights throughout the region are also being canceled during the slow season so it's definitely not a Nicaragua thing we're just not one of the super popular routes that's able to stay open and weather this particular storm so roughly three months the super cheap flights are gone and yes we're noticing it <clears throat> there is no way basically for the rest of this year to get cheaply back to the United States. All the prices have gone way up because the existing airlines or the remaining airlines are picking up the slack from Spirit and Spirit was one of the main carriers to the north. So it's really noticeable that they're not going to be there. Hopefully no problem by next year. Uh, we're flying south. Uh, 
really soon after you see this and flights southbound where you're not affected by the American airline collapse. Basically, we're looking at a current like minor collapse of the American airline system. Like it's bad. We're seeing plane problems. We're seeing supply problems. We're seeing personnel problems. We're seeing computers being hijacked. We're seeing running ancient systems, incompetent IT, bad management, horrible, all kinds of problems. And, and governance in the United States starting to crack down on the industry not having been doing a good job. And so all kinds of problems, plus American uh, passengers have gotten much worse, and that's creating a lot of problems as well. So they're also dealing with more stuff. So anyone who's flying into the United States, you're starting to notice massive explosions in cost. People who are not, and in this region, we can avoid, at least in many cases, flying through the United States or with an American airline. And by doing that, we're actually seeing the prices can be absolutely incredible. I'm going to be talking about that in some upcoming episodes in maybe one or two weeks. Uh, so be looking for that. We're definitely going to touch on that on episode coming out maybe around the 28th, uh, and, and we'll talk more after that. But uh, there's definitely some improvements that you can do by where you go. But if you're coming from the United States, you're going to be stuck with the current high cost. But we're hoping by like January, February, that we'll see those prices come down again once the airlines return and the holiday season is over. So I hope that answers your question. I hope that's useful. And I hope no one gets caught with too big of a bag because we just haven't and got lucky maybe. But I don't know of anyone who worries about the sizes on Spirit. But the weight, look out for that 40-pound limit. It really will catch you. After our video on phones and the power of phones, Andrew O'Neill had a follow-up set of questions. Hello, Scott. Wow, thanks, that was very helpful. I have a few follow-up questions for you. If I decide to ditch my US number, basically, I, w I wouldn't need it for business, and I wouldn't really use it to call US numbers while I'm in Nicaragua, because he would have, presumably, an office phone. Uh, what would you say would be a solution to all the websites that you would need a phone number to use for multi-factor authentication to log in? What number should I use? Uh, would I use the local Nicaragua number for that? Would that even be possible? Or would I just use a business phone number for that? Because I would no longer be able to receive text messages from my phone under that number. So this is going to depend, right? This is going to depend a lot on what you currently have, what you're looking to do. So the first thing is, I generally don't recommend shedding your US number unless you are just completely, completely burning all your bridges back home. Consider how little it costs to maintain a US number. That's very possible. It is generally a part of your identity and not something you, you often want to give up, especially for Americans. We have a tendency to think of our numbers very differently than they do in the rest of the world. The rest of the world thinks of numbers as kind of burner things. They're not part of your identity. But for Americans, they definitely are part of your identity. And American businesses think of it that way, as inappropriate as that is. This is a way that the poor are uh, disproportionately punished compared to the rich, because rich are able to maintain phone numbers for a lifetime pretty easily, and the poor often have to give them up. Uh, coming from my own life, I've managed to maintain my phone numbers my entire life, but I lived in a zone where the the FCC renumbered the zone. So while my seven digits of my house phone were consistent uh, for most of my life, the first three digits changed when I was a teenager. And so every number, every listing, every printed thing had to be redone, and we lost that. It was like a really jarring experience to come from a place where our area code changed, right? Because I grew up in the 716, and now where I'm from is the 585. Like, but we were 716ers, the same as, like, people use those things as part of their identity. Other parts of the country talk about, I'm from the, you know, whatever, and then they're referring to their area code. That's a really strong thing. And we had that ripped away from us, and and our numbers were given to someone else. So, so my childhood number, even though I never lost my phone number, was given to someone else, and, and without ever giving up the service. Because they got the same number with my original three digits, but I didn't get to keep those three digits. So the, even in the U.S., there's some serious problems with this. But if you're from the wrong region, you just get screwed. So it's always a problem. And that's something that could happen. with, with like they've, they've fixed a lot of that now, but it has always been a problem that if you're from the right areas, uh, if you're from the right neighborhoods, numbers were forever. So some businesses, and people have reported specifically, a lot of banks like... Uh, a lot of businesses in the United States have a tendency to either be completely clueless, but that's hard to imagine how clueless they'd have to be. Uh, quite often what we're dealing with is businesses that use the requirement of, of stable U.S. phone numbers as a means of making it more difficult for less affluent and immigrant clients to use their services. It's 
obvious what their end goal is, but it's a soft one. It's hard to prove, and so it's very difficult to do anything about. Businesses are basically allowed to behave this way, even when they basically represent arms of the government and are using this to manipulate who their customers are likely to be a little bit, uh, just making it much harder for certain groups to use them. But because of this, I generally recommend if you're an American, you keep that American cell phone, just go to a, a minimal plan, find a way to get that as cheap as possible, whether you go to a prepay or a really low end plan, or like me, because I like to travel, I like to have a backup here, I really like the T-Mobile. I generally recommend keeping it because there's always going to be something that comes up and all it takes is, oh, I forgot that I put my phone number as this thing that I only use once in a while. Ah, like it's going to be a big problem, right? So move to a plan that works internationally and at least you have some protection. Um, if you completely shed it, you can find banks who won't use it. You can find businesses that use a number. Like I use multi-factor all the time with my Nicaraguan number from US businesses. It's not generally a problem. There's no technological limitation. That is purely a business refusing to do business with you. Uh, so it all depends on who your, your businesses are going to be. Um, and in many cases, you don't need to use a phone number, but in some, you do. So uh, your mileage is going to vary. A lot of people never need it or, you know, they can work around it. Some people just need it because I run a U.S. business, because I travel, because I have so many services like this. I keep the U.S. number. Don't think twice about it. It's just not that much money uh, considering how much you save in life. And you're going to be running a business in your case, at least. Um, I would I would seriously consider keeping it. It's just a bit of safety net. Um but there are ways to shut it. Can you text a business phone? Could you move that number or a number to a business phone and get text that way? Absolutely. But again, some businesses simply refuse. They do detection to guess whether you're on a cell phone or not, and will simply refuse to text certain numbers. Real problem, I've had customers run into this. The problem here is you're not dealing with laws, you're not dealing with standardization, you're not dealing with technology limitations, you're dealing with independent businesses doing independent things and arbitrarily blocking you for reasons of their own. And so you have no control over it other than not to do business with those entities. Um, if you are going to do business with those entities, you have to pay whatever price it is that they levy for doing business with them. And that's how it is. So depending on the, that just may be something that you require. Uh, uh, also, if I understood your video correctly, if you have an iPhone or a different phone that has eSIM technology, then you technically don't need to get a separate phone when you get to Nicaragua. Even if you have a normal phone, they normally have more than one SIM slot, so it's rare that you would need another phone. And even if you only have one SIM slot, you can go back and forth, but that's annoying, <laughs> right? But you can. Um, it is really rare that you would get a separate phone when you get to Nicaragua. I don't know anyone who would do that. Um, I'm sure there's a use case for that, but that is not the normal. Norm. It's an option, of course, but no one should expect to do that. The expectation is for the last 15 years, having multiple SIMs physically in your phones is very normal for travelers. Like not every phone did that back in the physical SIM era, but travelers were always seeking those out and using that. So you'd have two, one that was like your main stable number and then one that you changed whatever country you're in. Um, for people who didn't have that, for, for travelers who are on a really strict budget, you would just change your SIM card and use whatever one for the country you're in at that time. If you know you're going to get a text messages from someone, you pop out the one you're in, pop in the one you need that is super annoying, but you could do it. E-SIMs are designed to take the dual SIM card thing to a whole new level. You put in as many as you want and you put them into a priority and you can just turn anyone on that you want at any time. So like right now, my phone is set to Tigo because I'm charged. I'm on a prepaid plan. I said this on the other video. I'm on prepay with my Tigo, which is my local Nicaraguan number. So right now I've got service. So that is my listed number. All my data goes through that. All my calls go through that. If for some reason I run out of that, which happens every 15 days, and if I don't have a reason to pay for it, I just let it lapse because it doesn't. I don't lose the number. Then. Uh, I switched to my T-Mobile, which has uh, cost for calling and slower data, but it totally works. So I just switched to that. And as long as I'm around the house, like it's only if the Wi-Fi goes down, which is like never happens. So I'm prepared, right? And if I just step out and go for a walk or something, I don't need my Tigo plan while I'm out for a walk. I just need to be able to send a message. And in an emergency, I can re-up my Tigo plan while I'm out for a walk uh, and, and use that if I had to. So no big deal. Um, but so I can just switch back and forth. And we do this all the time. And international phone users 
have always done this. Like, this is just how the world works. Only in the U.S. do you have this, like, multiple phones and, like, really complex SIM relationship. All that stuff is purely American and Canadian. Um, yeah, you put in as many SIMs as you want, and... And, and they can all be active, or you can switch back and forth, but you will have a primary that is what gets used all the time. So yeah, you definitely don't be looking at multiple phones. That's just a whole bunch of money. Unless you have a super special use case for that, like you really like having an iPhone and an Android for some reason, you know, don't do that stuff. Uh, that will keep it nice and simple. And then you have one device with everything. Uh, my last question would be, if I really don't want to continue paying for a U.S. phone number, do you know of any way that I can either transfer one of my U.S. phone numbers to become a business phone number? So in the U.S., it's called the Portability Act. All your phone numbers, with there's super rare exceptions for unregulated local businesses. Um, if you have one of those, like my, my little hometown had its own phone company, which I grew up in one of those, uh, then you, you have fewer rights as an American. Literally, you grew up in an area where your consumer rights weren't protected the same as the majority. Welcome to the lack of rights in poverty-stricken parts of America, for real. But they're very, very rare. Uh, but they do exist, and I'm from New York, which is a state where had a lot of those. The poorest communities were often saddled with a few fewer rights than, than normal Americans. Same reason I lost my area code as a kid. So uh, unless you're, you have a phone number from one of those, and generally cell phones can't have one of those because there's no little tiny cell phone players like that, then you have the right to own your number in the United States, which is a good thing. And so you can port it to anything you want. You can port it to a business phone. You can port it to a cell phone and back and forth. No problem at all. It's your number. Do what you want with it. And then you say, like, is it possible with a Ring Central or one of those services to transfer your cell number over to there? Yeah, absolutely. It's your number. Put it where you want. Uh, or you have to have like a different number for that. Generally, you're gonna want a different number for that, right? You don't want people perceiving your cell phone as be like, it's your personal number. If you're going to do that, and I do, right? Like I have my business phone sitting right here and um, like you can call my office, but my old home number, not my cell phone, that's still on my cell phone. Uh, but my, because that will confuse people, right? People make calling decisions based on their knowledge of what the number is. So you don't wanna be mixing that up. It generally, like you can, but generally you don't want to. But my home number, which I got over 20 years ago, uh, when we lived in Geneseo, New York, it was our house number, right? And it was my wife and my shared house number. It was like, it was our, like, we used to have numbers for our houses, not just people, right? Cell phones are numbers for people, not businesses, not houses, not locations. They are individual numbers. House numbers are for a location. They like serve different purposes. So my house number, I ported to the company system so you can call me on that number still and it will come to me but I don't have to have a separate phone system I share the one with my business that has made life really easy so I have that continuity of you can call my house um, and of course I can have extensions with it so I could have my kids have extensions my wife have extensions we can call each other I can call my dad on it um, and he has an extension on the system too which is one of those powers of having a business system for home and actually we've toyed around we've talked about doing this like offering a business phone system System or a business-like phone system for expats because you could do things like have plans where you have family in the, in like the U.S. or Canada or anywhere in the world and they could have like traditional phones. This isn't great for like Gen Zers, right? But if you're like Gen X like me or or uh, a boomer and you have parents or, or older siblings or whatever who are less likely to want to use WhatsApp, they're just not comfortable with those things. You could be really easy for us to come up with ways to do plans where they could put real phones on their desk and you could have real phones or use an app. Like you could use an app and they could have a real phone, but not be dialing public numbers so you don't have any of that like cost. Like that's what makes things really costly. And then you could have unlimited calling between your family members on traditional phones. Like that's not a bad idea. I could see, like, I mean, as a world traveler, I've always done that. I always have had an office phone because I have to, I work and I, Make sure my dad has one. And so we're able to call each other on a normal phone anytime. And that means speakerphone, headset, handset, anything. But he can also reach me when I'm on this. Like, so super flexible, um, but gives that old fashioned phone feeling for people. So that is uh, that is a thing that, that may work, 
right? The, you have a lot of options. You basically have control of your systems, but I, I really generally going to recommend don't give up the US number. It's it's a blessing to have one. You have access to it already. Just keep it. Look at how little of an expense it is. Don't make it a pain point unless you absolutely need to cut that budget. And then just figure out how to get it as cheap as possible and don't worry about, you know, uh, don't worry about it. But if possible, I would say keep it. On a separate post, Spark 6710, since it says this is in response to the phone uh, video as well, this is intriguing. Well, better check it out later. Japanese are getting rid of landlines entirely by next year, I've read, and I'm sad. Uh, I said that shouldn't be sad at all. All landlines are fake. They're a terrible technology. There's literally nothing good about them. They are pure evil. Like, truly, landlines are and have been evil for decades. They are a way of fleecing customers. They provide nothing of benefit. It's impossible for them to provide benefit. So any perception of, of landlines being good in any sense is a misconception of phones. Like, guaranteed. Landlines are horrible. They have no purpose in the modern world or the recently old world. They existed as a necessity in the 80s and most of the 90s. But by the late 90s, they didn't have a viable place except for, we already have them in place, we're not willing to get rid of them. By the early 2000s, even that wasn't acceptable. They are absolutely terrible. Now, she responded. That's not exactly what I wrote, but she responded, hmm, I really like regular phones over cell phones for brain damage, tumor concerns, and more privacy. So a couple important things here. Uh, that is not describing landlines. Landlines are not regular phones. Landlines are a vestige. Regular phones are VoIP phones. All functional phones are VoIP. And landlines, for all intents and purposes, have not existed for a really long time. People think they exist. And they think they exist because some people like the term and have demanded them. And some people have been tricked into paying too much for them. And so what the phone companies do is they provide new phones up until you can't see it anymore. And then they turn it into an old fashioned looking phone so that you think you're getting an old fashioned landline, but really it's a modern phone just out of sight, uh, which is a little bit hard to explain, but all modern calls go over the internet, period. Any of your last bit of, of connection is just your way of connecting to the internet. Well, if you're doing anything that isn't going directly to the internet, that's just weird because you have internet for other things already, right? It's just to sell you an extra connection that's extra fragile and expensive. That's just bad. There's no upside to it, just a lot of cost and risk. Um, Spark says, I'd like them to be available at hotels and like hospitals, so on too. Again, 100%. None of that's going away. Landlines are none of those things. No modern usage phone is a landline. Also, I have experienced major inconvenience overseas for not having my local SIM card and my international coverage working only for calling the US, not locally. So I couldn't call shops, restaurants, or even taxis when in Wales or England. And I'm not tech savvy at all. Well, I had to ask employees at hotels, cafes, restaurants to do me favors and call them instead. It was miserable. I wish there had been old public phones working. Okay, so all of this is a completely different issue. The issue is they're not providing local phones for you, and that legitimately would be a handy thing and there's reasons to do that and there's reasons why they don't very few people need them it used to be that everyone needed them and now very few people do and so the value to it has almost entirely gone away the number of people who need them are extremely few however the need for these things is a hundred percent unrelated to landlines or landlines going away none of those things are provided by 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 landlines i own a phone company right we provide phones if you're a hotel we can provide you phones it would never have a landline. No ethical person would ever run a landline to you for the last 20 years. It is a totally different thing. You get phones over the internet. That is how modern phones work. So I have a desk phone, right? I pick up my, I always have a handset on it, so I have to, this is, there's actually a dial tone here that I can hear, right? Here I can put it, hopefully you can hear this. I'm putting it up to the microphone. There's a dial tone. There's a phone on my desk. I can dial different places. Right. But it is not a landline. It is a real phone. It is a VoIP phone. And so these are what hotels have had for forever. Hotels can't afford not to have this. Landlines cost outrageous amounts of money compared to VoIP phones. And they're very unreliable. And technically, in the U.S., they became illegal in 2021. There is a law about 911 calling and safety of callers, and landlines do not provide the necessary safety. So by 2021, they gave years of, of warning, 
uh, I think like 2019, it went into effect. 2021, you had to have your systems replaced. Landlines for businesses were illegal in the United States as of 2021, specifically because there were people who died because a child was unable to get a call out from a hotel because they used... In this case, it was a mixture of things, but basically they used old-fashioned landlines when it was irresponsible to have done so, and, and it cost, they were unable to get emergency services when they needed to. And so VoIP phones are required by law. They're the only thing that can meet the requirements of the laws for reliability of calling. Nothing has to be 100% reliable. It can't be, but they're designed to always work. Traditional landlines stop working under designed, properly working scenarios, and so they're not allowed. But all of the things that you're talking about, what it is you're wanting, is simply accessibility of local phones. Nothing to do with landlines. Yes, I agree. I think it is nice when hotels offer uh, local calling. There's a lot of situations where what you get into a hotel, you've lost your uh, cell phone or all these things, it's a problem. I don't know where you're running into places with no phones. Everywhere I go has phones. That's uh, very... Um, unusual for me, I guess small places, especially Airbnbs are not likely to have it. The world is changing and pl new places just aren't putting them in. But when I travel around Latin America and around the US, we're st we still have phones in most hotels that I go to. Uh, it's still how you call the desk and deal with stuff because like your cell phone, it's difficult to call the front desk from your cell phone. Um, so they still do the, you know, hit zero, talk to the front desk, do whatever. Uh, but the need for wake up calls and all those things that were done through traditional phones have mostly gone away. Um, so uh, you can imagine the average traveler, uh, one, doesn't need to make local calls, right? In most of the world, making calls is not a way to interact with businesses or travel services. It's done through things like WhatsApp. It's done through text to some degree. It's done through email. It's done through their websites. It's done through apps. And so the entire concept of calling has gone from something we did for everything to something we almost never do. And the use of the old-fashioned phone system to do those tasks has gone almost entirely away. And the amount that people want to use the phones that are there has mostly gone away. Um, and, and the average traveler, if you're in England or Wales, the average person who's visiting those hotels has a phone that will allow them to make local calls. And if you're a lot of foreign travelers, because foreign travelers who are uh, traveling regularly, like me, have that mechanism at their disposal as well. I could always make a call to England or Wales. I can call England or Wales from my cell phone or my desk phone right now, right? And I can take either of these things with me and make calls when I'm in England. So for a lot of people, it's already solved. So the number of people who don't have a cell phone that's able to make calls, who don't have an alternative phone that's able to make calls, and who want to make calls at all has become extremely few. So it went from being almost everyone to almost no one. And so the cost of maintaining those mechanisms, the phones in the in the hotels or whatever, uh, has become very difficult. And so really the, the issue is uh, why are shops and restaurants using old fashioned phones in Wales and England? That's Ah, that's where those things are really causing problems. It's not the taking out the phones, it's the places that are clinging to them uh, that's really causing problems. But of course, places clinging to old-fashioned phones are the bread and butter of companies like mine, so it is what it is. But phones have modernized, you don't need to have landlines. Like that's That's a really important thing to take out of your lexicon. I know that you know. 30 years ago, we talked about landlines. That's what came into our houses. But even our houses stopped getting legitimate landlines decades ago. My last landline, I, I actually, so I'm about to turn 50. I have never in my life actually owned a landline. Uh, I grew up in an area where the phone company was unable to deliver me a landline the entire time that I lived in the region that I grew up in. Um, I moved around all the time, so having a landline never made sense. I always had to have a cell phone for everything, and by the time I was in my mid-20s uh, and was stable, owned a house, and could try to get a phone number, I was still in the region where they couldn't get me a landline. I got a VoIP phone. That was 2001, 2002. Uh, so by that time, there was no, like, everyone with a landline was paying twice as much as me and got a lot fewer features. And in many cases, they couldn't even make it work because technologically, anyone delivering landlines in that era was struggling. And so, yeah, a lot of people, I mean, the majority of people got them to work, but I literally went through my entire adult life until modern phones. Never once was the phone company able to deploy a working phone to my house. So 
that gives you an idea of just how long it has been since landlines were, were really something that they were rolling out and, and functional. But because VoIP phones physically look like a landline, right, we associate the physical, some people associate the physical phone in your, in your location with being a landline. And so people use that term incorrectly, but landline's a very specific thing to something that you could never want. Like it's, unless you hate yourself, right? Unless you want your calls to be unreliable, sound bad, and, and be really costly, you would never want a landline. But wanting a phone on your desk, a physical local phone, yeah, absolutely makes sense it's the landline portion of that 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 doesn't. Um, so, and that's what the video is all about, is how there are no such thing as landlines anymore. That's totally a vestige. Modern VoIP phones fix everything, everything. If there was enough Wi-Fi, you wouldn't even need cell phones. You would just walk around and use modern VoIP phones and they would work so much better. But there isn't enough Wi-Fi everywhere. You still need the towers to provide you data. So that's why we do that. But VoIP sounds so much better than any other phone. Like it's not even, close how good it can sound compared to cell phones sound worse than old-fashioned landlines. Old-fashioned landlines sound closer to this than they do to VoIP phones, at least good ones, what they can sound like. Um, just every bit of the technology has moved to a place that our phones are today really, really, really good. But one of the things you did mention was privacy. So just to be clear, landlines, true landlines have absolutely zero privacy. They are the most insecure mechanism that there is. A cell call is encrypted. It is not heavily encrypted. It is not great security. Do not think of it as secure by any stretch. Not at all. However, and, and, and this is important, all calls on the public switch telephone network, meaning any call where you dial a phone number is insecure, period. You don't have privacy if you're making a call through the US government's phone network. Doesn't matter what mechanism you use, it is not secure. Okay, that is a given. Those calls are wide open and listened to, period. Now, if you use a cell phone, it is extremely difficult to tap that phone and listen to someone's conversation. It is far from impossible, but it is difficult. A casual person is not going to go around and listen to your calls. Or if they are, they are random. They don't know which call is yours. So they really struggle to find to so if someone's going to target you, it is extremely hard to do so. If you use a landline, you have nothing protecting you at all. You don't have the benefits of anonymity. You don't have the benefits of movement. You don't have the benefits of moderate encryption or encoding of the sound. It is absolutely broadcast. A person doesn't even have to get into your house. They can go up to the lines running anywhere on the street. They can stand on the ground and just have a little device in their hand that records your calls or talks on the line. There is nothing less secure than a landline. And that goes for fax too, right? Because fax just uses that old 100% insecure protocol. Now, it wasn't designed to be insecure before the conspiracy theorists jump in. It is a hundred year old tool that was, how do we put sound on copper? And they had to keep it until they figured out a way around it. So no one made it intentionally insecure, but that is one of the reasons why you never deploy landlines is the insane lack of security. All the privacy and security that people just assume exist in the universe are gone with landlines. But because they go into your house, there's a sense of maybe there's some kind of security. It's completely a false impression. So uh, when you're thinking that you want privacy, what you want, once again, it well is to not be on the phone system, right? If you're dialing a public number, everyone has agreed there's no privacy, but because they track your your calls and they record what is said. So they know every party, every connection, every, every word, right? Everyone knows, private companies, governments, anyone who feels like listening in, super easy. The, uh, and part of that is because it's circuit switched. It's not packet switched. So it's a guarantee that someone who taps your line which doesn't require physically tapping. You can just stand nearby because it broadcasts out because the copper, anyone who's nearby can record your call. They don't have to physically touch anything. So until you actually observe what they're doing and why would they be observable at the time, there's no way to catch them. So a person could stand outside your house with a device, record your calls. What are you gonna do? Call the police and say, he's recording my calls. They're gonna come and he's just standing there because the device is in his pocket. 
they don't have reasonable cause to search him and they can't take the device and rip it apart and he'll encrypt it. So there's no way for them to get into it, right? So there's, it's basically impossible to prove because you're broadcasting to the public and it is open for the public to listen to your calls. One could argue that you're literally forcing it onto other people when you use landlines, not over a big area, but kind of. And, and they have the right to listen because it's being broadcast. So, uh, because it, re it resonates off the phone lines. If, if you've never studied this, like anywhere nearby to a phone line, all the calls can be listened to because they just, they just it's like, it's like a, a really short range radio. So with VoIP, you're going over the internet. So you're naturally packet switch, not circuit switch. That alone provides a bunch of security. You have the uh, natural security of the internet, which is millions of times more secure, even when you do nothing to secure it, than phone calls, because it doesn't resonate off the line. You can't just listen to it and hear the sounds. You can optionally encrypt a VoIP call so that it's all but impossible to, to communicate, uh, to, to, to break into it. And calls on VoIP are not one uh, single circuit. So if you manage somehow to tap one part, the listening part, you wouldn't hear the other person's voice. You have to get multiple connections to, and reassemble them yourself. And so it's very difficult. Uh, even if you breach the nearly impossible security mechanism, then you still have a very difficult reassembly of the message and no guarantee that you got the right part. So there's a lot of pieces here. Plus, it's got just regular audio encoding that makes it a million times harder than regular unencoded uh, audio on on the line. Now, again, you can make VoIP super secure up until the point where it goes to the carrier. Once anything hits a carrier, it is wide open. So it doesn't really matter. The idea of securing your portion of a call is essentially useless. If you have something private to say, never say it on a public phone, not on a cell phone, nothing that dials a number. If you want to have secure conversations, you need to use tools like WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, Nika Abla. These things encrypt your entire message end to end, not just part of it, not just between your phone and the tower, but then it's open to the government. These things have encryption all the way. Some of them are better than others, but they at least give you a semblance of encrypting the messages. In some cases, like WhatsApp, they make it very public to the government who you are calling, so they know who, who, and when you called, but they don't know what was in the message. But other things like Telegram, Signal, and Nika Abla don't even have that. In the case of at least Nika Abla, which is a matrix protocol, there's not even a record of the call. So there's no way to even know that you made a call. So that the, even if they subpoenaed everything, the servers don't have a record of it. Nobody knows. It's completely anonymous. And so, uh, there are tools for privacy if that's actually a concern, um, which it should be, right? Everyone should be concerned. And that's why life in like Nicaragua is just more secure because that is solved. But uh, that is the, the basics of security. <laughs> on phones. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to uh, help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And as always, I'll see all of you tomorrow.